Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Did you know that July is Bereaved Parents Month? I know it's still a couple of months away, but I'm planning a special post for all of our babies in honor of this month. If you would like your baby to be included, you can email me their name at Sarah with an H at journeyforjasmine.com or send me a message on any of my social media accounts at Journey for Jasmine. Today's organization spotlight is on Myla's present. Here is what the founder had to say about her organization. My business, Myla's Present, was inspired by Wonderbly, a company that creates personalized books for children. When my rainbow baby boy, Arins, was born last October, I bought him a book titled When Arins Was Born, which beautifully narrated the story of how his name was chosen and its meaning. This made me think of my firstborn, Myla, who was born still in December of 2022, and how I would never have the opportunity to share such an experience with her. After reaching out to Wonderbly about whether they did books about children who had passed, and receiving no as an answer, I decided to start my own venture. Myla's Present aims to honor the memory of lost babies by creating personalized stories where they are the main characters. These stories, whether adventures, fairy tales, or comics, will keep their memory alive while acknowledging their absence. The name Myla's Present carries a dual meaning, symbolizing both a gift from Myla to families and the importance of keeping her memory present in our lives. These books will be available in multiple languages starting with English and Portuguese. They can be passed down through generations, serving as conversation starters and keeping our baby's names alive within our families. Additionally, I offer birthday cards for free on an annual postal subscription. This is currently only available in the UK, but with the potential to expand internationally based on interest. Other cards for occasions like Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Ramadan, and Valentine's Day are also available. The artwork featured on the birthday cards is created collaboratively by my friends and family on Myla's birthday, December 29th. Myla's present already has several titles aimed at mothers, fathers, siblings, and grandparents, with more in development to cater to various family dynamics. We embrace diversity and inclusivity, offering personalized stories that fit any family structure, including single parents, non-binary, and same-sex relationships. Most importantly, these books will acknowledge all lost parents, those who have experienced miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, chemical pregnancy, termination for medical reasons, stillbirth, infant loss, and those trying to conceive. I'm really excited to share this with other parents. Writing is my biggest passion, and I would be delighted to share with others. Our first title is When I Was In Your Tummy. Please follow us on all social media as Myla's present, particularly on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you so much for sharing about your amazing organization with us. Today, I am talking with Barb. She lost her first pregnancy at 24 weeks due to him having a rare heart condition. This heart condition led to a life-saving surgery for other babies who also had this condition. Barb then lost her 13-year-old daughter due to an undiagnosed brain tumor. After her losses, she went through IVF and gave birth to her final child at age 57. Hello everyone, today I am here with Barb Higgins. Barb, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'd be happy to. Um, So obviously my name is Barb. I am a mom of four beautiful souls, two of which live in heaven, two of which live here. I live in New Hampshire, um, have lived in this area of the country my whole life. Um, And what's relevant to my story, I guess, is that I have spent my life around children. I'm an educator, a teacher, a coach, um, a theater director, uh, you know, 
summer camp director, I surround myself with kids all the time. So I have a natural affinity for young people, uh, which can make my grief journey both easier on some levels and much more painful on others. Um, I currently have a podcast and I just wrote a book and I have a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old baby boy who I gave birth to at 57. So I have a crazy life, um, all of which is interwoven with really tremendous experience of experiences of grief and also amazing joy. And the two are kind of interwoven, which I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. That's how, that's how this journey goes. So that's me, a crazy 60-year-old with a 22-year-old, a two-year-old, and two babies in heaven. It definitely sounds like you have a lot of different skills though. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> exactly. I'm not super good at any one thing, but I'm okay at a lot of things. <laughs> hey, I like that though. <laughs> yep. yep. So do you mind uh, talking a little bit about your last story? I'd be happy to, um, as happy as one can be talking about these things. Okay. So I have sort of two parts to my lost story. Um, my very first, first pregnancy um, ended up in a loss and that was a very a sort of unique experience altogether. And I could come away from it at the time, not nearly as traumatized as some mothers might be. And, and I'll explain that. So I had just gotten together with my husband, Kenny, at that time, this was 1999. And uh, I was on the birth control pill, um, had no plans of getting pregnant. Once a year, I would go off the pill um, and get a period because I was a competitive distance runner. So I oftentimes, you know, I didn't, I didn't think it was healthy to just never have my period. And the pill did that to me. So I went off the pill. April was my, was my pill free month and had a period and went back on the pill in May. And about mid June, I started feeling not myself at all. I was gaining weight. I couldn't figure out why I felt bloaty all the time. I had this wonderful chest that <laughs> eluded me as a distance runner. I'm like, where, where did these come from? <laughs> uh, and, and I woke up one morning at the very end of June, lying on my, on my stomach in bed. And I felt, I just felt, you know, uh, felt something in my tummy. So I took a home pregnancy test and sure enough, I was pregnant. So I went to the doctor and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I had a period in April. So I must be six weeks, maybe eight weeks pregnant. And I was 15 weeks pregnant, which I mean, I'd gotten pregnant long before that period, which, which I couldn't understand. So I you know, explained it, but I was on the pill. And so I had gotten a really bad cold at the end of February, beginning of March, and I was on antibiotics and I wasn't a health educator yet. Did not know that antibiotics would negate the efficacy of the pill. And so I made a baby. So I was 36 at the time and that's considered old, which makes me chuckle now. And so I had an amniocentesis and in the amniocentesis, which was the big needle into the belly um, to, you know, and all this, the ultrasound showed a heart that didn't look right. So now I'm 16 weeks in, but I've only known this little baby in my belly for two weeks. He was a boy, found out he was a boy. And um, so I went for all sorts of intense testing once I had the ultrasound. The amniocentesis came back fine. There were no chromosomal abnormalities, but the heart was weird. So I had every test known to man all of July and August of 1999. And the upshot of this sweet little boy is they had an he had an upside down and backwards heart that only had one ventricle and one atrium. And the so it was like the arteries were transposed and then it was upside down. So the atrium was on the bottom and the ventricle on the top, which of course um, doesn't work because the heart works, the atrium fills with blood. And then it, once it's so full, the doors open and, and it gets sucked into the bottom of the heart and then pushed out. So if it's upside down, there's no ability for the, the suckage to occur. Does that make sense? The blood can't flow up in a heart. So he was in my belly, not needing oxygen or air. So he was, he was growing relatively well in there, um, but he would not have survived even a few minutes outside the uterus. And so I was in just a, a disaster. Like, and so the whole time I knew I was pregnant, I was, I never knew I was pregnant with a healthy baby. He was never, never healthy. So we got to about 24 weeks and we decided that we would induce labor and that if, and that, um, and that it would be late enough that if he were born alive and were savable, that he could be put in the NICU and taken care of. And if he didn't survive, um, the contractions and all and pass away, then that's what was going to happen. And that is what happened. He didn't even survive one round of contractions. So I gave birth to this beautiful, perfectly formed teeny tiny baby boy who we named Gordon after his grandfather. And, um, and uh, we, 
looked at him and loved him and kissed him goodbye. And we donated his body to Philadelphia Children's Hospital. Now, during this whole pregnancy, Kenny and I had just gotten together. Nobody knew that we were pregnant. We didn't tell anybody because we knew right away that it was um, a traumatic issue and we didn't want to involve his children from his prior marriage. So this was something he and I did ourselves. So the entire summer of 99 was me growing this baby and feeling him kick and, and developing a relationship with this little boy I saw on the screen knowing ultimately that I probably would never get to know him. And so when we were asked, would we be willing, because the heart defect was so um, extreme, would be, would be, would we be willing to donate his body? And we said, yes, that was not easy. And I, I harbor no judgment or opinion one way or another on what families decide to do with their babies. I just know, know for us, I felt like there had to be meaning to this. We received an autopsy report that indicated he would not have survived that it would have been a slow drowning, so to speak, that he just would have filled up with fluid, filled up with fluid. Um, and about two years after that, three years after that, we received a report that they had been able to, because they could see his little teeny heart so early in the process, that they were able to create a surgery that could repair the heart while the mom was still pregnant, enough that the mom could give birth and the baby would survive long enough to, to hopefully survive whatever treatment they could provide. Does that make sense? <laughs> So I felt, felt so much better. We felt, we felt better about that. So my grieving process for that, I mean, my milk came in and, and I was never going to have children at this point. I just didn't feel like I was going to be a mother. It wasn't in my, in my realm at all. However, when you spend 25 weeks with a baby in your belly, even if you only know about that baby for 10 weeks it changed. And so Kenny and I decided that we would get super healthy and you know, that yes, we did want to have children. And, and that was sort of what got us to have Gracie. The grieving process for baby Gordy was, was difficult, but it was almost like a dream I was watching because I, because there had not been any planning in the pregnancy, 14 weeks of that pregnancy. I didn't know he was there when I did know he was there. I already knew he was sick, perhaps irreparable. So I think in some ways that made it easier for me and not that anything is easy about this process, but so when we, when we would get the updates from children's hospital of Philadelphia, that made me feel a lot better. Like we had done the right thing. And I mean, I, you know, prayed hard about it. I'm not overly religious, but I do believe that God or the universe or whatever can really guide us if we listen. Um, and so I set about my life. So shortly after, well, a year, two years after that, I had Gracie in 2001 and then Molly in 2003. And the logical place we go, and you may have done this as well after your first loss is that, all right, I've suffered this. It won't happen to me again. I've, I've paid my price. I've been picked. I'm good. And I remember thinking how lucky I was, not that there's luck in any of this, but lucky that I didn't have the time to get to know this baby that saying goodbye was much easier. So flat, fast forward to 2016, and I won't go into all the details around losing Molly, but we settled a pretty substantial mal medical malpractice lawsuit. She had an undiagnosed brain tumor in her head. And for six weeks, we took her to the doctor, took her to the doctor. We were sent home. She's anorexic. She's stressed. Try meditation you know, here's some antibiotics, maybe you have a head cold, really just blew her off. And she had a brain tumor in her head that ruptured and killed her in the ER, um, lying in the ER after 16 hours, just being refused treatment. So that was an unbelievably traumatic experience. And I remember thinking, how can this be happening to me? I've already gone, like, what, what am I doing wrong? You know, the questions we mothers ask ourselves, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my body? Am I a bad person? What's, what did I do that this is my punishment? All of that, all of that, just swirled around my head for a long time um, after Molly's death. And I have to be honest, I still have those questions. And I think as mothers, we feel this huge responsibility by nature to protect our babies. And so when we can't, whether it's not growing them well or not keeping them here once they're born, it's just natural for us to own it. At least that's how I feel. Um, and so in the process of dealing with Molly's grief, um, much my grief with Molly was much worse than my grief with Gordy. And it's not a an amount of love. It's just the fact that I had 13 years to get to know Molly. And she was this, you know, growing up person in my life every day. So all of the what ifs, what ifs, what ifs that we, that we suffer, you know, baby Gordy would be 24. Now, what would he be doing? I'm on a school board with a 24 year old who shares his due date as his birth date. And I look at that boy all the time, young man now and think that's how big Gordy would be. Like these things never, ever go away. Molly's death decimated, decimated me in a way that Gordy's didn't. Um, and I, and I spent two or three years really just in a black, black hole doing nothing, really doing nothing. If I could get out of my house and sit in the yard for a few hours, I was having a good day. 
Um, I worked very part-time, you know, I still had Gracie who was in high school. I had to get her to events. So I was, I was able to muddle through a lot of the details of life, but I wasn't okay. And so in, in that whole grief process, um, I started having all these dreams that I should have a baby. So of course, in my head, I'm like, okay, stop. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not right in your head here. And I went to a couple of different doctors who agreed with me that I was not right in my, in my head. And this isn't something I should look at. And I was 52 at the time Molly died, just about 53. So, um, so I, I, um, you know, I was already very old on the baby making spectrum. And I I remember thinking back in my head that when I had Gordy at 36, I was considered a geriatric mother, you know, like, okay, (laughs) the words that we use. So I finally found a doctor, the the dreams were insistent. And I really did feel, I mean, grief, every, everyone's grief journey is so different. And, and mine was very, very, very sensory oriented smells and sounds would trigger memories. My dreams were insane, you know, just vivid. I had Molly dreams. I had baby Gordy dreams. I had, you know, just nightmares of the whole process of her death and removing her from life support. All of these things um, would come in. So I just put the baby dream in with that. And as, as I muddled through, you know, two, two and a half years from her death to really deciding, okay, I'm going to try to have this baby. I processed a lot of information, a lot, a lot of grief information, um, inside of me and my family. So I, I finally found a fertility clinic that would help a woman my age go down the, the path of having a baby. Um, and the process of that journey showed me that I also had brain tumors in my head. So the whole time I was fighting for Molly, not knowing she had tumors, I didn't know I had them. That was a difficult reality. Um, I found out that I'm a very, very, very healthy, healthy woman. um, And that I have a body that's ideally suited for making babies. (laughs) Okay. That, that might be a wonderful thing, but I I, I don't feel that (laughs) as a mother, I'm very good at keeping the babies. And I know that sounds harsh, but you know, I mean, maybe you don't, but this is, this is just how I feel that, that, okay, great. I can make them and grow them relatively well. Sometimes they live, sometimes they don't. And then I can have them and sometimes they live and sometimes they don't. These are the random things that would really course through my head. Mm-hmm. So I had, I've, I had a very easy time through the IVF process of becoming pregnant with Jack. And I was 50, I was 56 when I had the IVF transfer and 57 when I found out I was pregnant, I had a birthday in those 10 days. And I had a very, very healthy pregnancy in the process of growing a baby at age 57 the medical profession, rightly so, does every test there is. Everything was tested. And my local OB, who knew Molly, was involved in her delivery, um, was very, very insistent that I keep this pregnancy quiet. He was super supportive and happy, but he's like, you know, there's going to be a lot of judgment here. If anything does go wrong, people will judge you. You know, just keep this process to yourself, enjoy it, and just be in the moment with it. For me, feeling anything after after both of my losses was the hardest part. Listening to music, working out too hard, um, feeling the warm sun on my face, anything that I felt with any level of emotion was incredibly difficult. I just wanted to be numb. One can't be numb when you're growing a baby. So I had to be very in the moment, right, all that time. So in the process of all the different tests, I had to have a lot of the same tests on Jack, my current baby, that I had on baby Gordy one of which was a fetal echocardiogram. And that was the test in 1999 that solidified the fact that baby Gordy was not ever going to be okay outside of my tummy. Wicked stressful. So because I live where I lived then, I had to go to the same hospital. I had to go to the same room, you know, the same waiting room. And of course it all came rushing back. The big windows, the mural on the wall, like all of it just came, came back. So during the process of the fetal echocardiogram, which involves ultrasound, um, I chatted away with the, with the ultrasound tech and she knew of Molly cause Molly had been put on life support in that hospital. And so that made me happy that she knew of Molly. And I talked about baby Gordy all those years ago and that I had had this doctor with an Irish accent, um, perform the testing on me. And, and we, so we chatted about him. He had retired by then. So it was a very, very intense, you know, Kenny sort of sat quiet. Both of us were just lost in this recreation of finding out our baby son, our first baby together wouldn't live. So the cardiologist comes in, this kind woman, and she starts asking me all these questions about Gordy, baby Gordy. When, when did you lose him? What, what year was it? What time of year? What was his heart defect? Long story short, this cardiologist who had recently moved to this area and was called in because they were short staffed, 
perform the autopsy on my little baby that I donated to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she had seen his little heart and was able to say how they, it was upwards of 11 babies that had been able to um, be saved long enough to get further treatment. She didn't have any data on how, if they lived for, you know, but you know, my, my reality was he would have been born and died. Um, and so it was just the weirdest connection. Like, so she had, she had met, had seen both of my little baby boys, you know, on the screen and, and baby Gordy in real life. So that was an incredible sort of reaffirming connection for me. So I gave birth to Jack in March of 2021. Um, and he's now two and a half. The connections with Jack and Molly. So a lot of people will say, oh, you did this to make up for losing a child. Oh, and, and I just have to say that none of those things are true. You know, we don't have our second baby to make up for what we don't, we're not getting from our first baby. Right. Like, you know, families that have, you know, 10 healthy children, they don't have ch child number two, three, and four, because the ones they already have aren't enough. They, you know, the heart multiplies, you know, it doesn't, you don't divide your heart up into how many babies you have. It multiplies every time you have one. And, and Jack has everything and nothing to do with Molly. I will say that he does make life easier day to day because he's just this little rambunctious bundle of pudge. Um, but he also, also takes me back again and again and again to times when Gracie and Molly were little and what they were doing at that age. And, and so it's this, when I say there's tragedy and joy in every breath I take, you know, really my life is, is a fence that I straddle and happiness is on one side and, and sadness is on the other. And I'm never not in either place. I'm always in happiness, but I'm always in sadness as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would imagine, um, anyone that is interspersing children that live and thrive with children that don't understands that you, you know, you, you can't just be happy because happy things are in front of you. It doesn't take right. away the sad, right. You know? And so, so, you know, I get, you know, I, a lot of the comments I, I get are, well, now you can, well, thank God Jack is here. Now you can be happy. Well, no, no, it's not his job to make me happy. <laughs> you know, I, I, and, and if I have to have a baby to be happy, I need to rethink why would I have a, like, that puts a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the baby. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I can't answer why Jack is here, but I do know he's absolutely supposed to be here. If I wasn't, if I wasn't, um, having him, I never would have had all these tests. I never would have found out I had brain tumors in my head. You know, he saved my life, um, which is pretty amazing, you know, couldn't save Molly's life, but again, it wasn't his job to save either of us. Right. So, you know, I have this, this horrifying story and, and quite honestly, child loss is unlike other, I have lost grandparents. I've lost parents. I've lost younger relatives. I've lost best friends. And all of those were horrifyingly tragic events that pale in comparison to both of my child losses. And that's, that's hard to tell someone that hasn't lost a child. Cause we're only, we only know our worst tragedy and that's as bad as we know. So if your worst tragedy is your great grandmother dying at a hundred and it's, a, it's tragic because you spent every day of your life with her. Yes, that's tragic, but you're not mourning the same way you would mourn the loss of a 10 year old or a two year old or an unborn child or a child born sleeping. Right. All very different. So, so in a nutshell, that's, that's my, that's my story. I started my reproductive career, losing a baby that I didn't even know was in me for months, weeks and weeks and weeks. And then I had some happiness in there. And then I believe I've closed out my reproductive career with a pretty big miracle. Um, but again, it's not his job to be a miracle. It's just his job to be Jack. <laughs> I think that's amazing that, you know, he was able to save other babies' lives just you yes. know, for you. And I know that must have been a hard decision to make to, you know, to donate his body. But I, I just think that's amazing that, you know, what became. Oh, me too. Uh, me too. Me too. And we, and we thought long and hard about it. And I just, so sometimes to a flaw in one of the reasons I started my own podcast was I just wanted to retrace my steps to see if I could have prevented Molly's death initially, but also baby Gordy's like, what could I have done differently? What, when was the first step taken that led to that event? And, um, that's why I call it a thousand tiny steps. And what I've learned in that whole process um, is that I constantly want meaning for things. I want there to be a reason. If I can't, if I can't find an actual reason, then I need to create one that makes sense for me. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Oh, it does. And I, I do will, the same thing. I, yes, yes. And so the autopsy report, you know, the concluding sentence with his autopsy report was life not compatible, diagnosis incompatible with life outside the uterus, and that just saved, saved me at the time. And then anytime I got updates on 
the fact that he was helping other babies. They could reproduce his little heart on like a 3D printer. You know, so now they can look at a 3D version of that beautiful, perfect, flawed, broken little heart um, and use it to fix other babies. So that's been a huge, that's been a huge, um, uh, what's the word, a relief for me, like a, a solve, a comfort, because there's some meaning in it. Yes, my baby didn't get to live, but through giving him up again, his little sweet body, somebody else, somebody else's baby did. And that, that's, that's a huge piece of it. And I think as mothers, we also don't ever wish child loss on anyone. Um, mm -hmm. And if our loss can be helpful in some way to somebody else, then it doesn't make the loss any better, but at least it gives it a little bit of meaning, a little bit of relevance in a way that isn't just an unexplained trauma or tragedy. Yeah, I definitely sense. agree. Yeah. 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 I feel like, you know, even just sharing your story, if you, if you help one person feel better, like it, it seems like it's done its job, you know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Very much so. Um, and I have a foundation now sort of in honor of Molly. It's just sort of starting out and it provides Molly was big into theater and that sort of stuff. And so we just try to get children into the performing arts because it's an unbelievable way for children to cope with trauma and loss. So <clears throat> You look at siblings, all your babies, your living babies and your in heaven babies, they all on some level know of one another and understand the sadness that goes along with not, you know, your children are growing up in a home with a mom that knows what it's like, like to lose a baby. And that's profound for them. Um, you know, Gracie never met her big brother because he died before she was born, but she knows how much it affects me. <clears throat> and there's been so much research around children and the grieving process for children. And that one thing that helps them a lot is the performing arts, theater, singing, dancing, playing instruments, because you can lose yourself in the process of creating music or mimicking music or acting out the role of somebody that's not you, spending some time on stage as somebody else. Um, they've just found a lot of they, meaning all sorts of different trauma researchers looking at how can we help children with trauma is... Um, a really easy way to do it that doesn't make them feel like they're in therapy all the time is theater and, and things like this. So that's a big driving force around um, the Molly B Foundation right now. But because Molly's death was so medically connected, as was, I mean, most deaths are, but a lot of Molly's death was a lot of how she was treated as a little girl. And then a lot of women in the IVF process, in the childbirth process, in getting treated as a woman for any things, sometimes med medicine and insurance isn't on our side. And I don't want to be political at all here, but I do find that we have to fight a lot more for real basic services than men do. And, and so I'm hoping at some point when the, when the foundation is a bit more established <clears throat> that we can look into funding programs that help families that have, and moms that have repeated pregnancy loss, families that have child loss, those types of trauma, losing your sibling, you know, you know, to, to focus on women and babies and how can we create support and comfort and health, comfort and health for women going through these things. Because I, I, I think as much as, as we do, a lot of it's what we do for each other. And it has to be bigger than broken moms helping broken moms. I mean, that's a great way to start, right? But it would be nice to have a bigger societal understanding and a lot less judgment. You know, if one more yeah. person tells me enough time's gone by, I shouldn't be so sad anymore. <laughs> that, that can be tricky. Like I don't I get can't that. be responsible for what happens the next time somebody says that, right? <laughs> well, that, oh, no kidding. Yeah, exactly, exactly. My new response though, uh, when people, when people who I know have not lost children try to tell me how I should be feeling, well, you know, and they give me their opinion, I'll, I'll just be like, oh my gosh, I never knew you lost a child. And then they look at me, well, I didn't lose a child. Well, my goodness, how would you know what to tell me then? You know, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you how to fly. I have a friend who's a pilot and he was constantly, constantly, constantly trying to tell me, well, you know, if you did this, if you did this, if you did this. And, and I finally said, you know, if you, when you're flying planes, have you ever thought of doing this? And he just looked at me like, you don't fly planes. I'm like, and you've never lost a baby. Ta-da. <laughs> and some, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it takes that kind of response. I don't, I don't want to be mean spirited about it, but you know, you know, this as a mom, not only do you have to take care of your broken heart, you sort of have to take care of everyone around you, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I can't be too sad because it might make the people around me uncomfortable. So put on your happy face and step into the world. And, you know, it can be, it can be a lot of responsibility. Not only do we have to make sure that we're okay, we have to make sure that our unokay doesn't affect other people. 
Yes. And that's, that's a perfect that's, way to describe it. I mean, people yeah. just expect us to just be normal and pretend yeah. like it didn't happen. And yep. inside yep. we're broken, you know? Yes, exactly. The other one thing that people say to me a lot is I just want the old Barb to come back. Well, the old Barb had an alive daughter in the way old Barb had never gotten pregnant, you know, with baby Gordy and had that child loss. So I'm sorry, those barbs don't exist. I can't imagine you think they would exist. <laughs> I remember one of my runners asking me, do what did I think I would change after having Gracie, you know, after having a baby? Cause we really like you the way you are. Cause I was this free spirited, you know, cross country coach. We, you know, I spent a lot of time with my team cause I didn't have, you know, a family to go home to and everything. And I said, well, I hope I change, <laughs> you know, I'm having a baby. I should change. If I don't, that might be a problem. <laughs> but it, I've never forgotten that conversation because it it's amazing the many hats we're supposed to wear and how those of us that expect a certain hat don't want that interrupted, you know, right. you need to be the barb. I want you to be all the time. <laughs> and, and it's uh, like, well, I need you to be the person who understands that I won't ever be the same again. Yes. Yeah. So where's that person? <laughs> Go dig that hat out of your closet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I don't exactly. know why people can't like accept that and understand that, you know, it's not just, I mean, we lose our baby, but we, we lose so much too. Yes. I mean, yes. we lose the whole lifetime. Like it's not just yes. this one single moment. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And we lose all the what ifs and what we thought would happen. And, you know, so I'm old enough now that when I was, you know, in high school and, and young, there was no immediate pregnancy test. You had to go to a doctor and do a urine test or a blood test. And so you wouldn't really know you were pregnant until you were like sometimes 10, 10 weeks in. You, you know, you, you don't have your period. So, you know, okay, I'm late. Okay. I'm now I'm two weeks late. And then you get to your next period and you have a super heavy, heavy period. Well, that very well could be a miscarriage that you never even knew was a miscarriage, you know, like a really early on one, because you don't know you're pregnant five days before your period was supposed to come. We have such early access to knowing that we're pregnant that we have sometimes, you know, knowledge can be power, but sometimes knowledge brings with it a whole bigger picture of, you know, it opens up, it opens up the reality for a lot of other things to happen. Um, and, you know, and, and yeah, so oftentimes you wouldn't even know you were pregnant until you were well, well into the pregnancy and we don't have that now. So I feel sometimes that miscarriages get diminished because like, I can remember my mother, God bless my mother. I love her, but she only knows her reality, you know? And, and she was, I, I don't understand why so-and-so got so upset over a 10 week miscarriage. If she was in my generation, she wouldn't even thought she was pregnant yet. I'm like, well, because she's known she's been pregnant for 10 weeks. Like she got 10 weeks that you didn't. So she's not just losing mourning a late period. She's mourning this little heartbeat that she's heard. And you know, that, you know, I think sometimes medicine can be a blessing and a curse. That sounded all jumbly what I was trying to say there, but Essentially, yeah, I, think I got so, it. <laughs> yeah, we have we have so much knowledge now. And, you know, I look back at Molly. She had this the brain tumor in her head. They said she had been in there her whole life and that for whatever reason at puberty, it started to grow really quickly. And with Gracie, I had every test there was because I had lost baby Gordy. And when I got pregnant with Molly, they said, You're, you would still be considered high risk. We can do all this testing on Molly. And it was the testing was extreme and difficult. And so I said, no. And I looking back now, I realize if I had said yes, they probably would have seen the little teeny tumor in her head. It's something that probably would have shown up. Talk about self-blame, you know, like, why didn't, why didn't I just use the, why didn't I just, but I, it wasn't in my reality at the time. You know, I had every test and the number of times I asked about Jack, Jack, does he have a brain tumor? Do you see anything in his head? Can you look in his head? Does that look okay? Like, they're like, calm down. His head's fine. I'm like, don't tell me to calm down. Okay. You know, <laughs> this is not my first time at the rodeo here, you know? So those are things, you know, medicine is sometimes super helpful, but oftentimes we have a lot of knowledge long before we're ready for it. And long before, um, we start developing a relationship way earlier than mom's even a generation ago started because they didn't know they were pregnant for all those, all those weeks. I knew I was pregnant with both Gracie and Molly and um, Jack, Jack long before I was supposed to have another period. It, I just knew because be on the stick and there's the faint little line. And so, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I found out super early with uh, a couple of my pregnancies. And then of course I'm like, Oh, that's longer to worry too. Yes. Oh, and exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That blissful ignorance of you know, oh, I'm late. Hmm, when didn't I use protection? You know, all the, the basics right. of how it used yeah. to be. 
back in the day and you didn't really know for sure until you were, once you'd missed a second, like doctors would, even the urine test wouldn't pick it up um, until you, you were at your second missed period. Like you had to be really yeah, be well. Pretty far, it. Yeah. 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 You know, and that's two months of living for us knowing that there's a baby in there. So, right. And, and yeah. And as moms, two more months of worrying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Moms like us anyway, I think, I mean, you know, I, I guess a lot of moms, you don't worry until you have to, I think the other part of grief that I know, and I'm sure it's this way for you. Well, we just talked about it. First days of school, first days of all the things that we just assumed would happen that didn't, that you don't get pregnant and think, well, I might lose this baby. So I'm not going to think about these things. And then you don't lose a child and say, well, they're gone. So I'm never, I'm so I'm, so, okay, I'm never going to have another first day of school. I just won't think about them now. It's all you think about, you know, yeah, exactly. every, every, we still haven't put up a Christmas tree. And our last Christmas with Molly was 2015. We go to Disney now. We just do something different. So Jack will have wonderful Christmases, but they won't involve, at least not yet. We're not there. You know, the standard Christmas tree in the living room in the bay window. We're just not there. It's my life, my story. Jack will have wonderful Christmases. They will just be different. <laughs> And I think, you know, there's no right or wrong way to grieve. We all just have to do what works for our family. Yep. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Were any of your lot, not that this is about you, but I'm curious in terms of your, you know, you've had multiple losses as well. Um, and this is a question I get asked a lot and, and I don't feel that losing baby Gordy, I'm flinching about them. I don't feel that losing baby Gordy helped me with losing Molly. So when I get asked this question, I'm just, I just look weird, but I will say my grief processes are different. And if I, and, and so are, were yours fairly consistent? Like, or, or did you get new surprises with each loss? Maybe that. I, I would say that, um, you know, like you said, all of them were different. Um, yes. the later loss, my stillbirth was worse for me than the two miscarriages. Absolutely. Um, at the time, my miscarriages were the worst because it was, that's what you the had worst right. I had been through. And then, yes. yeah, when, when, um, you know, but we never saw heartbeats with them, um, didn't know if they were a boy or girl, you know, they were both just super early. So I don't have the same connection right. as with my daughter who I felt in my belly for 32 weeks. Yeah, no, no, no. So, and that's a whole just... different level. I think about that. Like, like I look, you know, Jack is two and a half. And if I were to lose Jack at two and a half, that's a whole different level of mothering and all the, all the neural connections between mothers and children, you know, Molly had developed some independence. So she spent all day away from me. Jack is at, we call it big boy school. So I have some time away from him, but when he's home, he's attached to me, yes. you know, he's either nursing or in my lap or following me around or, you know, snuggled up to go to bed. Like he's with me all the time. It would be such a different level of loss. And I think a stillbirth versus an early miscarriage is just two completely different losses, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I, yeah. Yeah. So and, you're, and I don't, you know, I don't ever like to do the, the comparison that some people no, do right, because, right. you know, we only know what we experience. And so Correct. you can't say just because somebody was only six weeks that they don't have the same grief as somebody else. You know, I just, I don't like no, that people try yes. to play that game. I know. And we also have no, we don't know what went into creating that little six week experience. And, and was that pregnancy test, you know, after years of trying, yay. Right. You know, like all the things that go into, into pregnancy and all of it. But I think it's the, what if grief that is hardest for me is like, is. what would she look like? Where would, where would he be? If he were born, would there have been a Molly? Who, who might I have instead of, you know, like all of the things that go into life and being a mom. And uh, it's like that never ending list of questions. Yes, and what ifs. Yes. Yes. All the what ifs. And, and. You know, I have, I did a spiritual mentoring group that was super helpful for me, but I got very, very tired very quickly of, of really being just told to move on, move on, move on. You, you're, you know, support groups are helpful, but they keep you stuck in grief. Oh, no, 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 no. They help me process grief. So I'm not stuck in it, right. you know, like, you know, and it's not something that I should just move along from. I use, I use the term move along because it doesn't sound like I'm moving on from something. It sounds like I'm moving along with my life and I bring my grief with me. I also like the analogy of grief being love. You know, we love our babies from the minute we know they're in there mm -hmm. until we do or don't hold them until we do or don't watch them grow up until we, you know, we love them. And so 
that never goes away. I haven't stopped loving Molly. I haven't stopped loving baby Gordy just because I can't see them. I love them mm-hmm. hugely. I just don't get to show it. And sometimes the most poignant way I can show it is the times that I grieve really hard, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I liked, you know, what you said earlier about, you know, being on the fence with one side is, is the happiness and one side is the sadness, because that's pretty much how we live the rest of our lives. Yeah. Like never knowing when we wake up, which side we may fall on. Yep. Or if we're straddling both and we hope it's a short fence, you know, <laughs> that'd be uncomfortable. Sometimes it's a tall fence, right? But, yeah. 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 But yeah. You know, just those unexpected things that, that trigger you or that trigger memories or that, you know, we just yeah. never know what the day's going to hold sometimes. Exactly. 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 Are you involved in initiatives or foundations or things like that around child loss? Or um, it, some, or I'm mostly involved with, um, pregnancy after loss support, which, oh, um, for like people who are going through pregnancy after loss, I got involved with them, um, while I was pregnant with my daughter, um, after our loss. So, yes, yes. Um, I, oh, wonderful. I'm involved with them and I think they're a great organization and I've heard of a lot of other organizations, um, too. There's you know, and what frustrates me is that when I went through my loss, like none of this information was given to me. You have to just kind of go out and find it yourself and you don't know that they're all out there. Yes. Yes. No, exactly that. And I feel the same way. Um, another big piece of loss can be sibling loss. Um, and we sent Gracie to a camp. It was called camp Aaron and it was for children that had suffered a traumatic loss, a parent, a relative, a caretaker, a sibling. And Gracie got so much out of it because Sometimes children are the invisible victims. You know, Mm -hmm. we think of mothers, grieving mothers and grieving fathers and that sort of thing. Um, But again, I lived on my phone after Molly died because there were so many online groups, so many Facebook groups, the compassionate friends. Um, But those are for, those are primarily for the loss of a, of a living child. Um, And I, when I lost baby Gordy, I, there was online wasn't like it is now. And no one in my process, no one at the hospital said, Hey, here's a group you could go to, you know, that it was just take care of yourself now, you know? Yeah. Like come back if you're pregnant again. Yeah. And then, and then the other piece too, is I'm not quite sure why I had to deliver that baby on the maternity floor. Like I just feel sometimes like hospitals should be designed where they have rooms that could be overflow rooms. If there were 90 gazillion moms having babies, but could be rooms for moms that are, that are delivering still, still born, you know, Babies that have died, you know, like, why do we have to be in a hallway where we can hear other babies crying? Like that, you know, that piece is, you know, that when I went up to the hospital to to deliver baby Gordy, you know, I'm just, you know, you, you're in the hallway and there are balloons and it's just like, what, what? like, really, do you have to have reminding me of what I'm not getting? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, you know, I could see a small hospital having physical constraints, I guess, but I also feel like you know, if it's a small hospital, you can certainly walk down a hallway or take an elevator up to check on a mother that's delivering, you know, a miscarriage, you know, right. Why, why do you have to plop them right in the middle of what they'll never experience, what they're not going to experience that time? Yeah. I had right. to have, not- I had to give birth to, to mine on a, on a maternity floor too. And thankfully it wasn't as crowded. So they kind of, they tried to put me as far away from yes, everybody from as they could, yeah. but yeah. yeah, it's, I was like, I don't want to be on this floor at all. Yes. Yes. This is called the family place and I'm not adding to my family right now in the way that I want to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. These are, and these are all, these are all these little things that I don't think cross people's minds until they go through it. Um, I am so utterly grateful for all the support. I belong to two or three different support groups. Um, and they're all one, a couple of them are through Facebook. Some are just online. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful. One is called Ellie's Way, and that's a uh, primarily grief, dealing with grief. But they go into all different sorts of grief. And one of their little areas is um, pregnancy loss, which which I think is wonderful because it's it's a huge area of grief for so many women and men too. But definitely, you know, another piece that was helpful in my grief process, um, you know, right away with Molly, and then applying it to my, losing baby Gordy is um, learning that our nervous systems connect, um, to the babies immediately. So, you know, you learn, if you want to learn to throw a basketball, you practice and practice and practice, and then you lay down pathways in your brain and then you get better at, and then you can start to do it from memory because you've created those neural pathways and moms and babies create those in the belly. 
and they, when the baby's born, they don't dissipate, they get stronger because now they're not right there to talk to each other. So the mother has to find the baby and the baby has to hear and find the mother. And so they, so they become incredibly strong. So when you lose a baby, okay, the neural pathways of the baby no longer exist. So the mother's neural pathways don't dissipate. They just intensify and you can't train them to dissipate. You have to train them to react differently. So, so you've had, and me too, anyone that's lost a pregnancy, you know, before, before delivery date and all never even got the chance to develop them separate from being inside the body. So you have all these neural pathways looking for this baby that is no longer in your belly and the baby out of the belly isn't responding because there is no baby out of the belly. That's just the scientific piece of it. So when doctors, you know, oh, you, you need medication or, oh, you're not responding well to your grief or, oh, you're still grieving. Well, there's huge scientific reasons why you're grieving that belong to your brain and the nervous system connected to your baby. That was really, that took a lot of pressure off of me um, when I was, you know, really, really struggling. And, I, I, you know, when I'm having a really bad grief day, I just acknowledge my brain. Ah, oh, you're looking for baby Gordy right now, or you're looking for Molly. You know, I get it. You know, it just takes the stress off a little bit. I had no idea about that. That's yeah. really interesting. It's incredibly, it's incredibly interesting. Um, you could just Google it, neural pathways between mothers and babies. Um, it yeah, makes it, sense though. Yeah. You know, it would make well, sense. It's survival. It's like, think of like, if we were living in caveman times, you know, and we're in the middle of the woods or in the middle of the desert and we have to, you know, go collect water or, you know, we have to keep our babies alive. We're going to be utterly connected to those babies, um, in more ways than just emotional and spiritual and loving and all that it's survival. Yeah. The human body is pretty amazing. I have to admit, but that took, I had an amazing therapist. That's another thing, finding, finding grief therapists that truly understand grief, not, oh, I can make a lot of money being a grief therapist because a lot of people need grief therapy. I'll read some books. And I had a woman, I don't know her losses, but I do know that I never once was made to feel that I wasn't managing my loss. Well, she really got it. And she's the one that, that said, look, I'm going to, you know, she's the one that explained it all to me. And then I went home, of course, and Googled it and just read and read and read. And it was incredibly helpful. And it's very different. You know, I had 13 years of, of, all that goes into communicating with my children, you know, Molly's at school all day. So sometimes I'd get a hunch and sure enough, 10 minutes later, she'd call me and I don't feel good. Come get me. You know, those little, those little intuitions. There's a lot of research that says those aren't intuitions at all. That's actual physics, you know, and energy and brain chemistry and all that. So it took a lot of pressure off me is, is my point here, I guess, is that I stopped being some emotionally incompetent grieving mother and became a very, very healthy brain centric grieving mother whose brain was looking for that baby <laughs> made me feel better. I love that though. That, that makes me feel better too. Like I'm definitely yeah. going to go like research that. Cause I, yeah, I think it was that's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. 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 So I had little activities to do. Like she said, all right, so stop. Here's what I did. I would drive to my CrossFit gym to work out. And the first three roads were the same way as Molly's school. And so I would drive to Molly's school. I wasn't paying attention. So, you know, that's the, those neural pathways. I'm thinking about Molly. I'm going to drive to where I think Molly is. And my brain wants to find Molly, Barbara, you got to find Molly. So I, so she had me reroute the way that I drove everywhere, not just to the gym everywhere. If you always go out your driveway and go left, now you need to only go right, just go right out of your driveway. And what you're doing is you're not triggering a neural response in your brain. That's going to send you on a journey looking for your, for your child. So th those specifics might not apply so much like those wouldn't apply so much in my baby Gordy loss, but other things do hunches. I have physical sensations I have that can send me into, you know, a grief moment, rethinking how I rethinking, okay, what's going on here. The ability to step back to acknowledge, all right, brain, what are you telling me? As opposed to feeling bad that I'm sad again for the 800th time. And I think that is important to listen to what your brain's yeah. trying to tell you, not try to yeah. like push it off. Like I mean, it's easier to push it off sometimes because you're like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to like yeah. think about this, but exactly, we got to right, listen right. to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And you mentioned oh, that goodness. you're uh, writing a book. Yeah, so the book is called Motherland. Um, and so it, it sort of, it encompasses, and I call it Motherland because there's a lot more to being a mother than growing a baby, giving birth, raising it, sending it off to college, walking it down the aisle, whatever, you know, like there's so much more to being a mother than that. And so- in my book, Motherland, I talk about having and losing Molly. I talk about the process of having a baby Gordy and losing him. I talk about 
Gracie and raising her, I talk about Jack having a baby at 57 and all that went into it. So it's, it's not an easy read. I'm very, very, I'm a bit too honest. Sometimes I, I was one of those kids that if I thought my friend's mother's haircut looked funny, I'd be like, your hair looks funny. You know, like I just would, (laughs) I got in a lot of trouble as a kid. I had a fifth grade teacher. I didn't like so much. And I told, well, you know, I'm not good in class because I don't really like you. (laughs) I had to stay after school for a long time. You're supposed to think those things, not say them, right? (laughs) Actually, as an adult, a good friend of mine said, you know, Higgins, there's this world, this this word, it's called thought. And that's when you have (laughs) ideas in your head and they stay in there. (laughs) They don't come out. (laughs) They're like, well, I'm not good at that. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> yep. So the book is a hard read, you know, cause I, I wasn't, I allude to the fact that I had some pretty significant substance abuse after Molly died. Um, my marriage was in shambles before Molly died. And I talk very openly about some of the decisions I made that caused me a lot of guilt after Molly's death. Um, but I, I, I share it not because, because I want to share the true story. I can't create a story that will make people feel sorry for me because Molly is gone. It, I, it, that's not fair. If I'm going to be authentic, I need to be authentic. I also feel um, that we put a lot of pressure on grieving mothers. You know, um, I had a newspaper a magazine article written about a TV commercial that I did. And the woman compared me to, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, you know, holding his dead body on her lap. And, and I, I was like, I was in the picture she was talking about, I was holding Jack sitting in a Canyon. So I'm like, are you comparing my alive baby to crucified Jesus in my life? Like it was ugly, but I think sometimes that we create these ideals and these visions of what you're supposed to be as a mother that's had repeated pregnancy loss or what I'm supposed to be as a mother that's lost, had a pregnancy loss and lost a child. Like, and we, we create these visions that we now have to live up to. So the book, I tell the story. And uh, I leave a lot out, but I, but because you can't, you can't fit my life into one book. Um, but it's it for for any for any mother that is struggling to understand how these things happen and why they happen, and um, and what if anything could I have done to change it? This will be a helpful book. And that's writing it was partly cathartic for me, but also partly. I know a lot of mothers who can't share their stories, who don't know what to do, who could read this book in the privacy of their own home, who could throw it in a fire if they didn't like it or give it to a friend if they did, and it will help them in some way. So that was really my big motivation. And if the book ever makes money, all the money it makes will go into the Molly B Foundation. So it's so by telling Molly's story, it supports um, her initiative, you know, her initiatives and what she wanted out of life, that sort of thing. Um, Yeah. So it's just, it's just, it's not an easy read, but what book about child loss is an easy read? You know that. (laughs) Yeah. You you don't read those for fun. Like, you know, right. Exactly. For a feel good story. (laughs) One of the things we did, you know, baby Gordy's death was no one knew about it for years and years. Um, Molly, when Molly was on life support, I called up the, her elementary school, her middle school. I called up Gracie's high school. I put it out there on social media. Please come say goodbye. If you want to say goodbye to her. Once we knew she wouldn't wake up because she looked like Molly. She was pink cheeked and just, she was on tubes and things, but she looked like Molly. And we probably had close to 800 visitors over a five day period, come and say goodbye, all her friends. And, um, and I thought back to, I lost my best friend when I was 10 and I found out she was dead because I read her obituary in the paper. Like she had disappeared and my mother would tell me nothing and nobody would say anything. And, and so, um, I didn't want that to be Molly's legacy. I didn't want Molly's friends to think, oh, Molly just disappeared. You know, she's, where did she go? Um, And that was, people questioned that. Why would you invite all those people into your last week with Molly? I'm like, because it made it an incredibly beautiful week. I learned about Molly. I learned things I never knew about her. All her friends got to say goodbye. But the main reason was a selfish one on my part. I was very, very triggered by my friend Maura dying and me not knowing about it. And I didn't want any of Molly's friends to feel that way. So I feel like that's how we, we, you and me as grieving mothers can create realities that change the reality for others. Like you you helping, you know, working in that group with supporting mothers who are pregnant after losing a pregnancy, you know, that's, that's hugely necessary. And wouldn't it be nice if one day, anytime a woman was pregnant, one of the first things offered was look, if if you've lost a pregnancy prior to this, there are supports, you know, if if your doctor didn't know, like that should be right there. 
all right, yay. Let's, let's, let's just focus on making this a great experience. And in the meantime, here's a group of women that know exactly how you feel. And so I'm going to connect you with them as opposed to you having to, you know, find it. And so that's, right. and that's and a that, free so the, thing that they can offer. Yeah. It doesn't cost them anything. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Another neat thing that I found in having Jack, I'm able to nurse Jack, which I thought was pretty amazing at, in my late fifties, but I didn't produce milk like I did when I was younger. And there are groups of women that produce milk, overproduce milk. And they, they donate that there's a like online groups, human milk for human babies. And so I met this wonderful woman, Jackie, and she had 300 bags of milk. She just made a ton of milk. And so Jack was able to have only breast milk. Now I'm not against formula by any means. We have amazing formula. Now it was important to me to try to feed him breast milk. He could swallow it easier and digest it easier. Mm -hmm. But there's a support group that, that I felt, I, I found that I found it myself. Um, and along with the, the milk production, you know, the milk supply, I found these amazing moms that were just committed to healthy babies and to healthy moms and to helping out mothers that, that needed help in a way that, you know, you know, we don't talk about breastfeeding until we have babies. Right. So, yeah. And even then it's another one of those things you sometimes have to pretend that you're not doing it. Yeah. Like, don't do yeah. it in public. Yep. Yep. We were just at Disney. And so Jack still likes to nurse a bit. He's two and a half. So that's a long time, but I figured this is my last round of nursing. So I'll, I'll nurse. I mean, not a long, he won't be like 17 in nursing, but you right. Know I mean. <laughs> and so, but I was sitting on the bench and these women walked by and just looked at me with this nasty expression. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. And Kenny said, well, maybe it's cause you don't look young enough to be nursing a baby. I'm like, Oh yeah, that could be true. Like, what would I think if I saw somebody that was clearly in her fifties or sixties, I might be like, what? <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of gross, but it made me laugh. And I, I, I laugh at any time I can now. <laughs> That's good though. I think it's yeah. important. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if people wanted to find uh, more information about you, where would they go for that? Um, so my podcast is called a thousand tiny steps. And so if you just Google a thousand tiny steps podcast, it would, should come up. And that's also the name of the website. Um, I have a Molly B foundation website as well, um, that hopefully will eventually be much bigger than it is now. Um, and then social media wise, I'm, I'm public on Facebook, Barb Higgins. Um, so if you just Google Barb Higgins, New Hampshire, um, my page should come up. And then my Instagram is Barb underscore four, four, four. Um, so that's me on social media. Um, and I, and I love, and will always answer questions. Um, so if, if any of your listeners have questions about, you know, my pregnancy loss experience or my child loss experience or having a baby experience, any of it, anything related to all of this, I'm, I never turn down a chance to offer whatever it is I have to somebody, you know, which just seems to be what you do as well. This podcast is amazing. Thank you for oh, doing thank it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you. Thank you too, for sharing your story. I mean, it's, e it's easy, vulnerable to want to hide and you're not, you're, you're taking your tragedy and you're making it joyful by helping other people. And that, I guess that's what we all need to do, but it doesn't mean we all can. So, well, thank you. That, that means a lot to me. That's my goal. Yay! Yay. Thank you so much, Barb, for sharing your story with us. Personally, I have always been a believer that things that happen are not just coincidences. Like the call to have another baby, only to find out through that process that you also had a brain tumor. I know that many of us hate the term, everything happens for a reason. And you know what? I hate it too. I don't believe any reason is good enough for me to have lost Jasmine. But at the same time, I do believe that many things do actually happen for a reason. Such as the example that Barb gave. And I wouldn't say that losing Jasmine had a good reason, but it did help me find my calling to help other lost families. I think it's more that I hate other people telling me things happen for a reason, if that even makes sense. When other people say it, it's like they're just trying to justify why it happened or just trying to be comforting, and I don't find it comforting at all. Like I mentioned, I know it's a phrase that gets under a lot of people's skin. So all that to say, I do think there are positive things that can come from our traumatic experiences. And it's not saying that the loss is a good thing or that any reason could ever justify the grief and the pain that we've had to go through. But I do think that we can turn our bad experience into something else that can be positive. 
And I know we would all trade it in a heartbeat just to have our babies back. Hopefully this all makes sense and isn't just a ramble on my part. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. You can always email me at Sarah with an H at journeyforjasmine.com or message me on any of my social media at Journey for Jasmine. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.